575 Modificata Maranello would be the full name, quite a mouthful. You can brag to your friends that you have the larger 5.7 liter V12 under that long, beautiful hood. But man, this engine is awesome. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Bids, and today I'm being self-indulgent yet again. This is a 2003 Ferrari 575M Maranello, and it is one of my all-time favorite Ferrari models. And in today's video, we're going to be discussing its facts and figures. First, we'll take a general look at the 575 and talk about the changes that were made between its predecessor, the 550, and it. Then we'll get nerdy and talk about more of those technical details, and then we'll do what I have wanted to do for years and take this thing for a drive. Before I get going though, que surpresa, this 575 is currently for sale, being auctioned live on, of course, cars and bids. This is a 2003 575 that has just 12,800 miles. It's also finished in this beautiful shade of Rosa Corsa with a tan interior, and it has desirable factory equipment such as Daytona seats and the leather parcel shelf. It's also had a lot of desirable recent service done, including a major service and de-sticking of the famed Ferrari plastics on the interior. And if you've been in the market for one of these, after you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below where you can head to the live auction of this one where you can bid on it and buy it only on Cars and Bids. And we begin the story of the 575 by discussing what this car is and what Ferrari wanted to achieve with it. Now, unlike its predecessor, the 550, which was a complete departure from its predecessor, the Testarossa, Ferrari decided to take that design and they decided to iterate on it, to modify it, to make it better. And so this car would get the M nomenclature, which stands for Modificata. So 575M doesn't just stand for Maranello and then you have Maranello again after that. No, it's 575 Modificata Maranello would be the full name for this car. Quite a mouthful. Ferrari effectively would take the if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach with the design of this car, and it would remain largely similar to that with the 550. However, there are some small revisions to the design that they would make in order to make this car more appealing and, well, seem more modern and more fresh. The big change, though, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later in the video, would be the F1 sequential manual gearbox, which became available for the first time in a V12 Ferrari with the 575, and the overwhelming majority of 575s have that. You could still get a six-speed manual transmission, but there are about 240 examples of those in the world. So it certainly wasn't popular with the 575, even though it was available. Again, Ferrari's vision for the 575 was to take the 550 and make it more modern. And in the early 2000s, that meant adding the Formula One style transmission. That first debuted on the 355, it became very popular with the 360, and so incorporating it into the V12 line was very important to Ferrari, and naturally, you find it here on the 575. Ferrari would make effectively four different versions of the 575 throughout its production run. They would make the standard car, they would make a car with what was called the GTC handling package, which offered uprated suspension and carbon ceramic brakes and little touches to make it even more performance focused. They would offer a manual version of the car, and just like the 550, they would do a limited edition convertible version of the car, not called the Barchetta, but in this case the Super America, which happens to be sitting next to this one, which is a wild sight to behold. The manual transmission cars weren't a separate model of 575, but due to their rarity, the market certainly treats them that way. Regardless, Ferrari would make just over 2,000 examples of the 575 throughout its production run, and that's about 1,000 less than the 550 that came before it. Regardless, if you wanted the flagship V12 GT car from Ferrari, the 575 was what you got in the early 2000s. Now it's time to talk about the changes that Ferrari would make from the 550 to the 575, and we're going to begin by focusing on the exterior of the car. The entire body of this car, with the exception of the doors, was made out of aluminum, as Ferrari wanted to decrease the curb weight of this car as much as they could. They would also spend a lot of time on the front end of this car, changing the styling in order to make it more aerodynamic, but also in order to make it differentiated from the 550. Most notably, the front bumper is completely different. They would change the air intake dramatically to get more air into this car, but also to change the general look of the front fascia of this car. One of the notable differences to spot a 550 compared to a 575 is the 550 has fog lights on the front end. They look like fangs kind of tucked on the side of the grill. The 575, well, does not have those. Ferrari would also revise the headlight design for this car, making it body colored as opposed to just black. 
This was in keeping with the design language Ferrari was going with at the time, like the 360, which also had body colored headlights. The later Ferrari 612 would also have that exact same design, but you saw it here on the 575 as well. European market cars would also receive headlight washers, which are identifiable from these little ovals located in front of the headlights. US market cars don't seem to have those. I suspect that was due to some DOT restriction, but that's another way to identify a 575 from a 550. The last change up front that Ferrari would make to the 575 over the 550 has to do with its air intake located on the hood. Although it's very subtle and hard to spot, Ferrari would actually make this slightly larger for the 575 as they wanted to get more air into the engine, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Regardless, it's again extremely subtle and hard to tell, but those are all the front end differences that distinguish the 575 from the 550. The next exterior difference we have to talk about between the 550 and 575 would, of course, be the wheels found on this car. Just like the 550, they share a five spoke design, but for the 575, they got a little bit more special looking with some slight texture to them to make them look a little bit more modern. If you got the GTC handling package, you would get a different set of modular wheels. They're also slightly larger at 19 inch, the standard wheels, just like the 550, were 18 inches. Luckily, they're on the 575 Super America next to me, so it's cool to be able to look over and see both wheels that were available on the 575. Another thing that was available with the GTC handling package would be upgraded brakes. That car would get carbon ceramic brakes as optional instead of the standard steel units, which are found here on the normal 575. Just like the 550, it shares the exact same design. They have drilled front rotors and the brake calipers are largely the same. The rear brake calipers on this car would be slightly revised in that they would receive a larger piston, but otherwise the standard brakes were identical between the 550 and 575s. Moving to the rear of the 575, we come to the final rear exterior differentiator between the two cars, and that would be its trunk lid. On the 550, there's a slight depression located underneath the prancing horse for you to stick your fingers under and open the trunk lid. Ferrari thought that this kind of threw off the way the rear end of the car looked, and so for the 575, they made it one continuous line all the way across. You still have plenty of room to fit your fingers underneath there to open up the trunk, but Ferrari felt that this looked a little bit better, and that is the last way that you can tell the difference between a 550 and a 575 from the exterior. I should note there's technically one other way, although this car doesn't have it, in that some Ferrari 575Ms have the badge 575M located on the trunk. The Ferrari 550 never had any exterior badges telling you what it was. You just had the Ferrari logos and that was it. On this car, you could have the 575M badge on the back, but some cars have it and some cars don't. That would be the easiest way to tell the difference, but in this particular case, you don't have it, so you have to know everything else I've covered with you so far. Now that we're done talking about the exterior updates to this car, it's time to move inside and talk about what Ferrari changed in here. The first thing I want to talk about would be the gauge cluster design for the 575, as it differs a lot from that found in the 550. On the 550, Ferrari would split a lot of information across a variety of dials located on the dashboard. This was reminiscent of the Daytona, and the 456 used this design as well. But for the 575, Ferrari wanted to bring all of that information and put it directly on the gauge cluster. So you could be focused on your driving, look briefly at your gauges, and then go right back to driving. It's a subtle difference, but it's one of the big interior changes found on the 575. In the place of the gauges originally found on the 550, Ferrari would instead have air vents located in this particular area. The 550 had them too, but now this particular spot on the dashboard was completely occupied by air vents. Ferrari would also revise the center console of this car, making it a little bit cleaner, moving things like your window controls to the door, which makes a lot more sense than having them in the center console. But just like the 550, they would retain an ashtray located right on the center console. Unlike the 550s, which is made out of plastic on the 575, it is made out of leather and it looks extremely beautiful and hides the ashtray. But regardless, between both cars, Ferrari wanted to make sure that you could have a proper smoke. The other changes to this interior are relatively subtle. The door panel design would change, adding these little lines that kind of look like the exterior vents found on this car, and that's effectively it. The steering wheel also would be from the 360, but largely this interior ergonomically and design-wise is incredibly similar to that found in the 550. But we can't leave the interior of the 575 without talking about one of the largest changes to this car over the 550, and that would, of course, be the availability of an F1 sequential manual gearbox. That's right, the paddle-operated transmission. 
It was a really big deal that the 575 had this gearbox as it was the first time Ferrari would apply that to a V12 car and people really wanted it. In the early 2000s, this was the hottest, coolest, most cutting edge technology. And so having it in the flagship V12 Ferrari GT car was in high demand by their customers. As I mentioned previously, you could get a six-speed manual transmission in this car, but they are exceedingly rare. Only about 240 of those were produced for the entire world. And so getting your hands on one of them is quite difficult and they're very sought after today. But focusing on this transmission specifically, it's a Graziano six-speed sequential manual gearbox. And underneath, it's effectively a manual transmission that's operated by an automated clutch. The computer handles the clutch engagement of this car based on your driving needs. In addition to adding the sequential manual technology to this car, Ferrari would also revise the first two gear ratios for the transmission. They would use a three cone synchro mesh design for first and second gears, but they would leave the other gears unchanged. This is to aid with acceleration to make this car feel even snappier as it was the new Ferrari. So despite looking like the old V12 Ferrari, they wanted to make it feel even more performance focused. And now it's time to climb under the hood of the 575 to talk about the star of the show. And that of course is its engine. This is the F133 EG 5.7 liter naturally aspirated V12. And it's very similar to the engine found in the 550. They both have dual overhead cams, four valves per cylinder, and dry sump lubrication. But Ferrari would play with a number of elements to make this engine something special and make it more powerful. Most notably, the size of this engine would change. They would increase the bore by one millimeter to 89 millimeters and increase the stroke by two millimeters to 77 millimeters, thus giving it a larger capacity, 5.7 liters compared to the 5.5 found in the 550, hence the name for both cars. Ferrari would also increase the compression ratio for this engine from 10.8 to one to 11 to one. And they would play with the air management system, notably making a larger air intake on the hood to get more air into the combustion chamber for this car, thus making more power. The result is that this engine makes 515 brake horsepower and 434 foot-pounds of torque, a pretty sizable increase over the 550's 478 horsepower and 419 foot-pounds of torque. This car can also get from zero to 60 in 4.2 seconds, which is pretty quick, but it's not all that much faster than the 550. And the reason for that is this car weighs a lot more. It weighs 200 pounds more than the 550 did. And so all of this extra performance is kind of negated by the additional weight, most notably added by the sequential manual gearbox. So these cars are pretty similar in looks and they're also pretty similar in performance, but you can brag to your friends that you have the larger 5.7 liter V12 under that long, beautiful hood. Before we take this car for a drive, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that would be the suspension system found on the 575. Just like the 550, it has a double wishbone suspension setup with adjustable dampers. The difference with the 575 is they were revalved and they were automatically adjustable. This car had an adjustable suspension system that could sense the road surface and reportedly within 80 milliseconds, make adjustments to the dampers. They weren't magnetic like what would be found later on the 599, as this car kind of bridged the gap between those two, but they were adjustable and they were more trick compared to that found on the 550. Both cars have sport modes activated by this little switch found on the interior simply labeled sport, which increases the damper pressure, giving you a more firm ride for more sporty driving situations. But although the systems are very similar between the two cars, the 575s is a little bit more sophisticated as Ferrari wanted to make sure that this car got the best technology available at the time. All right, we're driving the Ferrari 575. This is a pretty special moment for me. I've loved these cars forever. Um, and I, they've been in my life for a long time too. My Uncle John has a, a six-speed one. And I'm up on Mahon Drive driving a 12-cylinder Ferrari. I mean, it's pretty special. So what's it like? Well, immediately, I think the thing to me that is really interesting about the car or just wonderful, dominates the experience is the engine. The engine's just so lovely. It's just so good. Yeah, I've often heard that these, this engine is, uh, is, is very refined. And then the 550, it's very good too, I have to say, having driven one of those. Never driven a 575, only the 550. And it's just silky smooth. and it's no slouch either. It really hustles. The thing is though, it's so smooth and it's so refined, you don't really notice how fast you're going until you look down and you're like, oh my God, we're really moving here. 
it's a big old lump of a, of a 12 cylinder engine and it is marvelous. And the way it delivers power is just truly sublime. The next thing that blows me away is the steering. It's really good in this car. The, uh, the thing with the, the 550 also is that was, you know, these were the early days of power steering for Ferrari. Uh, and they got it right with the 550 and 575. They did not get it so right with the 355. These cars, man, I, it's it's so good. Steering is really excellent. A good example of a nice hydraulic system. Then there's the suspension. The suspension in this car is soft. I had certainly read about how, how soft the suspension is. Uh, and in this car, it, it's certainly very soft in this car. Uh, and I, I definitely noticed that. As accurate as this steering is, I'm surprised at how soft the suspension is. This car is definitely, you know, designed for comfort, and I'm certainly noticing that. Um, you know, it, it rolls more through the corners than I was expecting, and the steering, if you kind of jostle it, it's like kind of, whoa, what's going on? And so definitely more focus for GT driving, but I can see that on a highway, cruising in this car, it would be very well suited to that. Uh, now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room though, and that would be the transmission. Personally, I have never really hated single plate clutch uh, transmissions. I think that they're actually pretty good when you learn to work with them. They're like, they're really, they're kind of fun in a way. It's kind of charming. Is it better than a manual? Of course not. You know, a manual is the way to go every time. And of course, me being me, having never owned an automatic car, manual is always my preference. However, the price spread on manual uh, 575s is extreme. Those are well over $400,000 cars generally. These cars are substantially lower, you know, all because of the transmission. And I don't necessarily think that's fair. Um, I think this car is plenty enjoyable with this transmission, uh, especially if you know how to use it. If you know, you know, you have to be a little bit mechanically sympathetic with it, I actually think it's kind of nice. Man, this engine is awesome. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Wow, the, the geez. Um, and I think actually the transmission and engine kind of pair nicely together. Um, again, I prefer that this car had a, a six speed manual, but like I'm having a great time out here <laughs> driving this car. Um, and I also have to say like on downshifts, like the, the transmission, lift the throttle for you. It's pretty smooth. You can help it out a little bit more by sort of staying on the throttle just a little bit. You learn to, to work with it, but it's honestly kind of a, a nice single plate clutch to use as, as single plate uh, transmissions go. I actually think it's, it's, it's kind of fun. But yeah, this is awesome. What a, you know, the 575, for the, the values that these cars now go for, especially compared to 550s, which have really taken off, this car offers such a wonderful experience. I mean, you'd be r really hard pressed, I think, to, to do better than this. And if the transmission isn't that big of a concern to you, the 575 is a great choice, uh, you know, compared to the 550 or, you know, a manual one of these, like that's a, a whole different ball game. If you want collectability, you go for one of those, um, certainly. But no, this is, this is really, enjoyable. I'm in love with this car and to be honest with you I'm kind of waffling a little bit because I don't want to stop driving it. This would be such a great car. I just this would just be a great car for road trips and special occasions and it would be so good at that. This engine is just so wonderful. And that is the Ferrari 575M Maranello. This car is everything that you would want in a traditional Ferrari GT car. It's beautiful to look at, has a glorious naturally aspirated V12, two seats, and it is rear wheel drive. These cars are also relatively rare and the 575s with the F1 transmission offer a tremendous value in the world of V12 Ferraris. And if you've been in the market for one of these cars, well, you can buy this one only on cars and bids. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll talk to you very soon. Goodbye.